All right, welcome back. This is video four or segment four in our uh, value cycling uh, biosphere rule number two a series. And uh, now we're gonna talk about the next level of value cycling and that's deep loop value cycling. This is value cycling that is done at the lowest level of the prior hierarchy. It's cycling that occurs at the material level. Um, and what's important to recognize is that no matter what your product is, at some point, you're going to need a deep loop value cycling strategy. It's just fundamental uh, to what we do. And that's because even if you have uh, a great shallow loop value cycling, you're, you're refurbishing, you're remanufacturing products um, successfully, that's great. That's a big advance economically and, and in sustainability terms. But the reality is, at some point, no matter how good your system is, the components, the elements, and the materials will become worn out. And just think about that term, worn out. It comes from clothes that we wear so long that they finally abrade or get holes in them or fray and are no longer useful anymore. And that's true for every material. It's just a, it's part of the, the nature of entropy. You know, things ultimately break down. And so, you know, either through corrosion or erosion or, um, uh, all of these different processes, at some point, your materials cannot be, value, cannot be shallow loop value cycled or epicycled anymore. And so at some point, you have to have a deep loop value cycling strategy. It's just fundamental. Um, now in nature, they, it's, it's built in. Death is nature's planned obsolescence. Death is uh, you know, the, the deep loop value cycling strategy because when, when an animal dies, the materials then are broken down um, and made available for the next cycle. And without death, uh, the, the, the biosphere would actually collapse. You could not, death is what allows a level evolution to occur. If the evolution didn't, if, if things didn't die, materials would be locked up in a, you know, a fixed set of organisms uh, and they couldn't evolve forward, right? And so death is fundamental to the growth and evolution of the biosphere. And so we need it at, uh, we need in, in our strategy, in our biosphere rule strategy, we need to have a deep loop value cycling strategy. Right? Now, we already take advantage of a deep loop value cycling strategy. Uh, hu human industry has been doing that for a very long time, but what we're doing is we're taking advantage of nature's deep loop value cycling anytime we, we use a natural raw material or a natural uh, resource, right? Um, so. Fundamentally, what we're doing when we when we take wood and use it to make a um, a desk, for example, or we take uh, natural fibers and use it to make clothing or a, or a basket, um, we have already, as long as we don't contaminate those raw materials, we have a built-in deep loop value cycle because those materials, the wood or um, in the right conditions and the fibers in the right conditions will break down and then they become raw materials for the next uh, growth. And so what we can do is we surf existing uh, biological cycles. Uh, and we can do this by creating new biomaterials. There are certain types of bioplastics and, and others that are designed such that um, when they come to their useful life, they can be composted. All right, so usually they don't, uh, you, you need to industrially co compost some of these materials. But, th but what they are is they're, they're surfing, you know, the, these biological cycles. They're taking advantage of existing um, uh, um, deep loop value cycling that occurs in the biosphere. All right, uh, and that's true though for, for a fraction though, a handful of, uh, of our materials. Mo a lot of our materials and probably the vast majority of materials are not derived from natural fibers or natural um, biomass or, or, or animal, uh, animal sources, right? And so um, we then have a, a problem then of, of deep loop value cycling these um, automobiles here in this case and all of their components that are no longer useful. And so this is, um, you know, it's been called planned obsolescence as you, uh, you, you probably heard and, and the automobile industry got in real trouble for this because they're their value chain, their linear system was so effective at producing cars, um, they pr could pr produce more cars than the market could actually use. And so the strategy was to plan obsolescence, make these cars become obsolete before the end of their useful life so that customers would then be forced uh, to buy a new car and, 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 and take the production that these really efficient 
um, uh, assembly lines were, were, were generated. And part of this, would they would design components to break down after a certain number of miles. Uh, they would also use fashion type styles. You know, you would change the, the styling of cars and every, every year you'd have a new rollout of the new models and like, all of these were, were really strategies, nothing more than to ensure that the public could buy as much of that throughput that they could get coming out of their value chain, right? Um, and it was called planned obsolescence, but really what it is, it was unplanned obsolescence because we didn't have a plan for these uh, products when they came to the end of their useful life, right? So we have, we, we need, uh, we really need real planned obsolescence now for these non-bio-based uh, materials. And for some products, or for some materials, there are functioning deep loop value cycling, and it has to do with the nature of the material itself. Aluminum, for example, is a, is a, um, a highly recycled or deep loop value cycled uh, material. Uh, in fact, it's estimated that over 60% of all the aluminum ever produced is still cycling in our economy, which is, which is pretty good if you think about that. Um, and the reason why is that recycling aluminum is actually far more cost effective than producing aluminum from uh, raw bauxite or iron ore. That bauxite is the mineral that uh, aluminum is made from. And you can see why, you know, al aluminum has already been refined. It's down, it's a refined high quality material that can be cycled. And if you wanted to produce raw virgin um, uh, aluminum, you'd have to go back to that unrefined bauxite and go through that whole process. So again, this is a way we're, we're maximizing the material productivity of, of, uh, of materials we've already produced and refined. So a number of metals, um, you know, steel and others, are, are, are already, there are uh, deep loop value cycling systems in place, um, and, and they're in some instances relatively efficient. But again, metals and natural fibers are only part of our, um, a part of our uh, material world in which we, which products are made of. Um, and so um, increasingly there's, uh, there's other materials, largely plastics, and plastics for many years now have been growing, the, the fastest growing part of the materials uh, basis of, 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 um, uh, of products, right? And so what we need also then is deep loop value cycling opportunities for plastics. Uh, and the problem is um, not all plastics can be deep loop value cycled. You know, um, there are two types of recycling that can occur or uh, deep loop cycling that can occur for plastics. One is a physical recycling where you basically remelt the plastic and then reform it into a new product. The other is called chemical recycling, and that's where you break down um, the molecules of the of the plastic and then reform them. So you're basically uh, creating you're you're creating new 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 plastic. What you do is you unzip uh, the chemical bonds and you break them into what are known as monomers, and then they're reformed into polymers again. All right, and so, but the, the, the problem is not all plastics can do that. And so this becomes an important design question. If we recognize that at some point, if we're gonna be sustainable, and we wanna, and the biosphere has been sustainable for three billion years, right? So we're not talking about just one or two cycles, although that, that would be a big improvement. Um, we need to think about cycling, you know, for generations to come. That requires us to have a deep loop value cycling strategy, and that means we have to begin selecting our materials that, such that they're capable of doing that. Um, and so there's, a, there, as I said, not all plastics are capable of, of this chemical level deep loop uh, recycling um, that allows us to unzip the, the chemicals and then reform them uh, uh, such that they have the same characteristics of virgin materials. So there are some examples of this. So we do have, we have some commercially demonstrated examples of uh, deep loop value cycling certain types of plastics. One example of this is the company Aquafil, which is based in Italy. Um, and they have developed a system to deep loop value cycle a certain type of nylon, nylon six. And so this plant can recover nylon, which can be found in clothing, it can be found in uh, sporting goods, many types of sporting goods and equipment, it can be found in carpets. They can take that in, pass it through their econile process where it's the, this is depolymerization plant, and convert that into brand new um, 
uh, deep loop value cycled uh, nylon that can be used as yarn and things to produce the next generation of products, right? Um, so this is one example of, of a, a type of plastic that is already, there is a commercially demonstrated and, and operating process for duping deep loop value cycling. Another example, a, a similar example is from, from Japan, a company called uh, Tejin. And Tejin has developed a similar kind of deep loop uh, chemically, chemical value cycling process for polyester, right? And so polyester is used to, to produce clothing and other types of things that can be collected um, and pass through then this deep loop value cycling process at Tejin and, and then used to produce brand new uh, plastics. And so uh, um, Tejin has partnered with Patagonia to do this. Um, Aquafil has, has partnered with European um, carpeting manufacturer, Desso, uh, and they are actually then have built in deep loop value cycling processes. So this is the, this is a fundamental point at, at some at some point, all products, all products, and all components will get to the point that they're, they have to be recycled at the materials level, which requires us to have a deep loop cycling strategy for every material we use. And so this becomes then another material recycling criteria, um, a material selection criteria. You know, for, it helps us um, begin to identify what el which, which materials need to be in our parsimonious materials palette. And the ability to go through deep, like, deep loop value cycling is a fundamental design criteria. Again, if we're not, if it can't be deep loop value cycled, at some point it, it, it's going to become unsustainable because it'll just be waste that will begin to, to pile up. Um, and it will be the same as if we have a linear production system. Right? So this is a fundamental thing that I, I oftentimes get frustrated with because people don't pay attention to. If we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about sustainability over the long term, we have to ultimately have materials in our closed loop systems um, that can be deep loop value cycled. All right, be back in the next video very shortly.